under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag, and pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Let us pray. My heavenly Father, we thank you for watching over our staff and our students. We thank you for looking beyond our faults to supply us with our everyday needs. We ask your continued blessings over us as we deal with the COVID-19. Bless those affected by this virus. I pray you enlighten the hearts and the mind of our students to understand that through Jesus Christ, all things are possible. Now we pray for our team of eight as we begin this meeting this evening. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. For his sake we pray, amen. amen. Thank you, Mr. Flores, Mr. Director. And again, I'd like to welcome all the guests to our meeting tonight. Uh, we enjoy seeing a crowd here. So, you know, sometimes we do this with just staff members, but, it's, you, you know, it, uh, you know, I'd like to see more people to come and get involved in the school board. Next thing on the agenda is public testimony. Nobody? Okay, next item three would be district recognition, parents and employee of the month for March. Mr. Bennett? Yes, sir. As we do every month, we bring you the uh, Panthers and Employees of the Month. We are still doing it via uh, the, the uh, video. Hopefully next year we'll get back to bringing everybody in, but right now we'll have the video. Again, as, as board president, we'd like to send our thanks out to our teachers and, and our maintenance people because without those people, we try to recognize them, but without them, our district wouldn't function. And they, they, they keep us running every day and they do a very superb job keeping us that way. So as well as our administrators at the campuses, they're doing an outstanding job that as well. So uh, with that, uh, next item on the agenda <coughs> is the superintendent's report. Uh, Rancho Paso Education Foundation presentation. Yes, sir. Um, Y'all know we hadn't had a education foundation at Rancho Paso ISD. Just hadn't had one, and um, talked about it for a few years, but it just never came to fruition. And then, and then when Harvey came, a lot of schools got funds through got grants through their education foundations, and we just didn't have anything in place. So. We, we figured out a way to get one started, so we, we have it started. Um, we have our nonprofit, all, all, everything's in order, and we've been working over the last few months to get everything really organized before we present the grants. Uh, some of the key things that we're gonna be involved with is increased community involvement and support. That's one of the big uh, things that this Education Foundation will do. Uh, we'll be able to provide a uh, district with resources for innovative ideas in the classroom that go beyond the local budget when these teachers have these ideas outside the box. And with us uh, following a blended learning framework, there's going to be a lot of teachers thinking of things outside the box, and this will help us uh, provide resources for them to get some of those uh, lessons and activities done. Uh, the Education Foundation supports the mission and vision of APISD school board and superintendent. Ms. Uh, Cook gives us an update every month at our meetings about the state of the district and some of the needs that uh, might be you know, coming up. It gives us an idea of, of what direction uh, we will need to go. And while the uh, Education Foundation does follow the mission, vision, and goals of the APISD school board, the Education Foundation is governed by its own board of directors, okay? And with that said, I'd like to introduce to you tonight our very first president of the APISD Education Foundation, Judge Elizabeth Wellborn. Talk tell you a little bit more. 
Thank y'all. Um, thank y'all for having us. I know that uh, the concept of the Education Foundation has kind of been talked about and circulated, and we have gotten ourselves off the ground, I believe. We are established, and so I'm here tonight to introduce us, um, tell you a little bit about what our mission and goals are, and hope that we have can, or can develop a relationship with y'all as a school board with the uh, Ransas Pass Independent School District so that we can further the education for the students of our community. So my name is Elizabeth Wellborn. I am a 1996 graduate of Aransas Pass High School, uh, second generation resident and graduate of Aransas Pass. Um, so I am dedicated uh, to the concept of the further uh, the education and goals of our students here in the community. Right now, in, like Mr. Bennett said, we are an independent nonprofit organization um, that works and operates independently of the school district, but we do so um, in conjunction with you. Uh, we want to be your partners in this concept of education and supporting our teachers and our students. Um, we are right now uh, 18 members strong as a board of directors, uh, all of which have some type of, of involvement and ties to our school and our town. Um, we have several, I think we, I think if I counted correctly, I think we have 10 members here tonight and I'll be happy to introduce them all to you. I'll start on the end. I have G.A. Hill, you might be familiar with him. Carla Schultz, uh, Ms. Coulter, uh, who all do I have? Can y'all stand? I can't even see everyone. <laughs> y'all wanna introduce yourselves? I'll be happy to let you do it. <laughs> Thank y'all so much. Um, we do have additional members that couldn't join us. They all had different types of obligations um, this evening. Um, but are definitely with us in spirit. Uh, so what does the Education Foundation do? Our goal is to raise money, to put that money directly back into our school district. Uh, we know that there is a need in our schools um, that goes beyond um, what can be funded. Uh, we are very cognizant about the fact that in Aransas Pass, we fall into a very um, interesting segment and that we do not, as you are well aware, derive a lot of money from industry, uh, like the local districts around us. Our goal is to go out and find that money and try to get that money back into y'all's hands and to our teachers' and students' hands so that their educational resources will never be limited. Um, in doing so, we will start a fundraising. Uh, we'll push for our initial capital fundraising efforts to go out and try to find that money and locate it. Um, we will continue on a yearly basis to raise funds to put those into the education system. At the same time, what we're doing is developing a system that will allow the employees, all employees, not just teachers actually, uh, to apply for grants when they have ideas that can um, be successful, they believe, in the school district and push those kids um, further ahead in their educational endeavors. Uh, so while we're raising money, we are getting everything ready to allow those grants um, to the application process to come into us and to start uh, the concept of putting that money back into the classroom. Um, our goals are to make sure that you as a school board, the teachers uh, and the students understand that the community supports them. We want to make sure that we reestablish that link uh, between the community and the schools uh, to push that uh, endeavor forward of education. And I think that is our, our basic mission. Um, is there any questions that I can answer for y'all in regards to where we are? In the next couple of months, what you'll see, I hope, are um, some push outs on, you know, where we've, we've gotten a logo, we're developing our website. Um, yeah, we're working on flyers. Um, we've, you know, got, you name it, we've, we've, we have developed our, our core, like, manual. I mean, we are a board of directors. We've taken all the steps to organize ourselves as, as, as an a, a organization. Um, we were um, fortunate enough to find a firm called Foundation Innovations that is assisting us in this process. Uh, and the reason that we're doing so is because we want to make sure we're successful, that this is not something that just starts and, and fizzles out but something that can be sustainable long after um, we are not here and so that it can continue to push forward uh, for the students of APISD. Um, so that's what you'll be seeing. We'll get our, our website um, going. We'll be able to start outreach to the community. 
um, be able to accept funds. I think we were pretty excited that we were able, just by our pure existence, to already make a difference. They were able to send a group of 18, 17-ish young ladies to a no, conference. 22. Oh, 22, even better. Uh, <laughs> to a conference in Galveston for women in industry. And the way we were able to do that is because we we're a nonprofit, we were able to receive those funds from one of our, of our local industries and use those funds to uh, send those young ladies uh, up to that conference and have that experience. So that's, you know, what we're, um, what we're created for. And so we were fortunate to be able to get that step done and hope to continue to do that as much as possible. Anybody got any questions for him? Question? Yes. Well, this is a tremendous endeavor. So uh, congratulations to all of you that are serving. We appreciate it and um, looking forward to your, to your launch. Um, so my question is, when do you anticipate or what's the target of, of opening up for to start receiving applications for grants and that type of thing um so i mean we're developing all of that right now we are in the so we have in inside our organization we have different um boards and and groups and one is tasked strictly with our rollout okay. um, we over the next few months we will have our official rollout where we will um, go start soliciting funds uh, you might not see a big fundraiser because our first target will be individual reaching out to things like uh, industry or um, trust that have to give out funds and so we're going to try to target those uh, originally on our campaign but as soon as in the next couple of months as soon as you know we get going mm -hmm. um, we'll have the availability to start receiving funds so anything from you know in memoriams um, people can donate just you know, out of their pockets on a monthly basis, we'll have those resources available for people to start sending in funds to the school or to the foundations for the betterment of the school. Wonderful, so, thank you. Thank you. And, and and please understand, you know, we want to make sure that we are working closely with y'all as a school district. One of our processes is that our superintendent makes a monthly report to us uh, as to what's going on in the school district so that we're also individuals that can then hear what is going on and if we have contacts or, or know of something that could be beneficial, then we can try to make those connections. Uh, we were very excited to hear about your um, career technology campus that is getting started and um, also trying to make sure we get some resources pointed that direction. Awesome. So, we're Fantastic excited. Fantastic idea. Appreciate all y'all oh. support and help. Well, the, the whole credit goes to Mr. Bennett and Ms. Drumgle. They started it, and then somehow we just stumbled upon it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank so. you both. <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> so we're going we're gonna to try to do as much as we can. I can, I can tell you we're a group that's dedicated to the, to the furtherment of the education of the students here in Rancis Pass. Um, everyone wants to see the school district succeed. Um, we know personally the, the hidden gem that we are. Um, we know the quality of the individuals that are in our schools and um, that are employed there. Um, it's just time everyone else knows it. I'd like I to say we'll welcome you all with open arms. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I think we, we're all very excited. So how can we as board members support you guys? What, what do you anticipate that would look like for us so that we can guarantee your success? Well, I think, you know, I th thank you for that question. I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, when we start that, that fundraising campaign, word of mouth, connections, who you know, who they know, um, you know, shout from every corner <laughs> that, that at the end of the day, we, we are in this unusual little segment that does not get a lot of, you know, tax dollars from industry and we sure could use it. And so, I mean, I think that's, that's bottom line is, um, you know, just encourage people to support. Every dollar matters, you know, even, even a small donation will at the end of the day make a difference. So, well, again, you know, uh, I would like to personally thank you myself and the fact being that uh, you guys are in this for the same thing that we're in for it is for the good of Ferrandez Pass, the good of our kids and, and, and the staff that are for, for our district. So our, our board here, that's, that's our, our, our underlying goal is to do what's best for this district and our kids and our staff and our teachers and people. And it's great to have you it, with your your goals being the same as ours so we can kind of work hand in hand so I'm kind of looking forward to it but I, I want to thank all you people for the dedication time that you you put in already and the time you're going to put in the future 
<laughs> because I know there's a lot of work out there that has to be done uh, as far as that goes to get those funds out there and a lot of, lot of, lot of leather on your shoes. You're going to wear out walking around and doing that. And a lot of people you have to meet. But uh, again, just remember everything you do is for those kids out there in our school to, to, to better them and give them a better opportunity to, to be successful. So we thank you. Thank and, you. I, and I can tell you all, you know, if there's ever a time in which you all have a question, a concern, um, just feel free to call me personally and I'll make sure that any issues um, are addressed or any questions are answered. I'm willing to give you uh, my number too in case you have any questions or if I can help in any way. Wonderful. So I'll be yes, glad sir. to give you my number and y'all can call me anytime y'all like. Awesome. And I'll be willing to we appreciate do what it. I got to do. We're excited to move forward. I know it's kind of a slow rollout, but we want to make sure we have all our, our ducks in line before we stick our head out there and <laughs> <laughs> make sure that we just want to be sustainable. So we're trying our hardest and we look forward to it. All right. Go okay. get them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank all you, too. Thanks for your, your time and effort you've been putting in already. And, and, and again, so we thank you for coming tonight, and we thank for you what you're going to do for us in the future. So, And if you all don't mind, I'm going to ask everyone in the foundation um, to step out so we can have a, a quick little word, and then I'm going to excuse them from there. All right. All right. That's <laughs> thank, fine. You all. thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give me a chance to so move out the door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're, they're in the hallway there, so. Okay. Okay, a bit. <clears throat> the next on the agenda is a literacy data report. Uh, clerk uh, presenter is uh, uh, Ms. Dominguez. And it's going to be a data report and a description of a report from Falk Elementary. Mr. Mansfield is about to come up and, and present the report for his campus. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background before he does that. Um, the first data that you're going to see is similar to what you saw last month when the campuses presented their benchmark reports. So he's going to present those benchmark reports for his campus. Um, and then he's going to present the House Bill 3, which is re a requirement um, for us to track our early childhood literacy and early childhood math several years ago uh, that was mandated and so we are required to look at uh, to set goals at the third grade level and then to backtrack that down to our kindergarten and pre-k level even and to uh, monitor progress on how they're doing so he's going to share information um, about all of that with you in his report hope everybody is good this evening <clears throat> there it is. Okay. You can go to the next page, please. Okay. To start out, uh, we're always looking at our passing rates with students. Uh, I've always had an issue with that. Just taking a look at my, ch my students in my school, we have pre-K and kinder. And a lot of our first graders have not, some of our first graders have not been to kindergarten. So we have this, it's almost like an upside down funnel. By the time I send them to Mr. Uh, Sager's campus, I need to sort of close those gaps as much as I can. Um, so one way we decided to look at that was through growth. So I'm going to go over our basic benchmarks and then we're going to look at some growth factors. Uh, we have students coming in that have never written their name or said any letters of the alphabet or counted. And then we have kids that come in that are reading. So it's hard to say 40% of our pre kers are passing because they've been in school for three months and they, just the exposure, uh, what they get before they come to us. So we thought, let's just look at how much they're growing with each year, and that'll be a better determining factor. Uh, what we have, we're going to have here is going to be, uh, when I get to growth, it's just an overall. Uh, we, are, we are narrowing it down to every individual student in the school. So the first thing you guys see is our basic, uh, basic report from our benchmarks. Um, if you look on the left, there's like a peach column. You have uh, approaches, meets, and masters. Then you have that 2021 20, peach column. That was our end of the year scores at the very end of uh, last school year. Uh, so when we were looking at this, we are doing, let me find my notes here. I highlighted a lot of green on my personal report. Uh, when I'm looking at like say grade one reading, at the end of the year last year, 79% of the kids were on, were either were at approaches. Uh, we're already at 74 this time of the year. Um, 
Another one was uh, just grade two. You see 50% of the kids at the end of the year were already at 54. Uh, the only area that really stood out to me is in the reading meets columns. The, uh, if you look at the end of the year last year, we were at 68% in first grade and 32% in second. Uh, currently, we're at 28 and 30 f at our beginning of the year and 34 at the middle of the year of 68%. And so I dug a little deeper. And what I realized is we have a whole bunch of kids that are right at the border. So once we get those, they're you know, within a couple points of moving from approaches to meets right now. So that's, we analyze, it's not showing it in this report, but that's something we are hoping keeps going up and that would put us equal to where we ended last year at, or if not better. Um, one little part I forgot to chat about here is I had a couple notes on our challenges we're facing. So let me step back a hair. Um, this year was a little different than previous. We've had spent a ton of time on social emotional with our little ones, our pre-Kers and kinders. Um, we, in my career, I've been there for five years now and I've been an administrator for over eight and I have never had to deal with uh, working with them on schedules and not throwing themselves on the floor when they don't get to play with a toy or not, or hitting kids when they don't get what they want. So our counselor is working now with counseling sessions uh, several days a week and lots of individual counseling groups. Uh, so our teachers and our pre-K and kinder levels had to spend a lot of time just getting schedules down with a kid. And when we nor normally would have been already working on counting and letters and small groups and projects in the classroom, they were still teaching them how to walk down the hallway, teaching them to how to control their, uh, when they get upset, little basic skills. And we relate that to COVID. A lot of them have been locked in their house since they were two years old and they haven't been to the park. They haven't been to the slides at McDonald's to play with other kids. And we are seeing that in the school. Um, a second challenge that affects these scores is the two big outbreaks we had in the district with COVID. So back in September, we had a ton of people out. And then when we got back from Christmas break, since we're teaching such foundational skills at our level, if they're not there, they're not going to get it. It's almost like a domino set. You know, if you take one domino out of that long row, it's never going to get to the end. So when we had several, you know, I had one class in first grade with uh, 19 students and for two weeks straight, she had between seven and nine kids in her classroom. So the teachers were having a lot of trouble moving forward with only half the class there. And then when that other half comes back, we had to spend a lot more time getting those kids caught up and working with them on stuff that we already uh, did with the other kids. So those are our two big challenges I just wanted to put out there uh, that we're dealing with this year. Um, some successes, I'm gonna talk about our tutoring here in a minute. We, our tutors are doing wonderful. We have several retired teachers that worked at Falk. Uh, some of y'all might have, the younger ones that were here earlier might have had them. I don't know if you want to hear Miss Hill, you might have had some of them. But we have a lot of our retired teachers that are helping now, uh, three days a week. And we were doing a major focus on reading. And our math scores are coming out a little lower. So now we are evolving to uh, do incorporate a lot more math since we got some basic reading down with those kiddos. Um, so from there, I'm going to move on to the next slide with um, our numbers on it, Blaze. OK, this is our closing the gaps. On the top, we have our goals. Um, we're working to get there, but I really wanted to focus on the percentage growth. So if we go down to the second column, uh, we can look at our pre-K. Uh, I have, I tried, I broke some of it down by our, uh, sub pops, but if we just look at all our beginning of the year, we had all positive across the board growth wise. So pretty much everything grew except for some of our sub pops, as you'll see in a bit, but at our pre-K from beginning of the year to middle of the year, we went up 9%. Our kinder, and this is in reading. And kinder, our beginning of the year, went up 4%. Uh, again, there was a lot of social, emotional, and we do have 147 kids right now, which is a bigger class than I've ever had since I've been there. So we have a lot of kiddos there. Um, our SPED, as we go through these, you'll see some of the numbers. It looks like it's pretty significant. That was one student. So when you see the SPED numbers, I mean, each grade level, I might have between four to seven students. So if you see a significant drop, it's maybe one kid checked out that passed it last time or one kid was just having a possible rough day and he just didn't do good on the test that day. It's not a large group of kiddos. Uh, so we see growth in our reading there. Next slide, please. Any questions on that, y'all, as I'm moving? Okay, now we're in uh, first grade. Uh, so I'm gonna go down to percentage growth again. If you look at our beginning of the year on the left line, all the way to the left there, we had 28% uh, on or above grade level. At the beginning, uh, middle of the year, which the middle of the year, y'all, we took the first and second week of December. So that's when we did our middle of the year testing. We had 6% growth by then. Um, all of our sub pops did good, and we noticed a significant difference all the way to the right under EL. That is our English language learners. 
Uh, we had one group drop, but for the most part, we're seeing a pretty significant uh, improvement in our EL kids. And a lot of that is just great teachers and exposure. A lot of them weren't exposed to using the English language that much in class. And we do a lot of small groups where they are communicating with other kids in English versus Spanish at home. And it's really significantly helping them with their reading skills. Yes. Uh, you can go to the next one, second grade, please. Here's our second grade reading. Um, if I go to the bottom again with our percentage growth, uh, beginning of the year, 28, me, uh, hitting the meets. And then uh, middle of the year, we had 34% of them, so that was a 6% growth. And you can see across the bottom with second grade, we had growth in every area. Uh, second grade was a huge focus on reading with our tutors, and you'll see our math scores didn't come up as much, and that's why when we noticed that, we immediately started switching our and combining more math and reading together. You can go to the next one, please. We're going to go to, oh, so our campus action plan. Uh, I meet weekly with my team and PLCs. Uh, weekly meetings vary after testing. We talk about testing and what we did. We look at the student data and how we can change and help it. We also compare the data to what we're doing with our tutors and make sure that we're adjusting our tutoring lessons based on what the data on the every three weeks testing is showing us. Um, we are utilizing a program called Waterford. It's a reading program. It's a smart program, so it it works with the kids at their level. Uh, my teachers are doing wonderful this year with it. They use it every day in small groups in their class, and they're also using it in our computer lab. We have a separate computer lab time every day. <clears throat> the teachers are uh, integrating differentiated lessons in their classroom. Uh, all of our teachers are participating in the Reading Academy training, and they're using strategies in that training in their classroom now. And again, whenever we're using new things, we do have some trial and error. We try some things, and we're like, that didn't go over well with the kids, and then we adjust very quickly. Um, again, uh, we're using tutors for small groups per pullouts. We're looking at our STAR 360 data, which is the main data you're seeing here, and we are comparing it to Waterford to uh, make sure the data is matching up. Uh, for example, all STAR 360 testing is computer-based, so I'm putting a seven-year-old in front of a computer for an hour and a half with a mouse, and you can start to see it sometimes. The first out of 30 questions, maybe the first 10 will be all perfect, and then as they're sitting there and they start to get fatigued, it'll go down. And so before we really use all that data, we'll also look at our Waterford data to make sure it wasn't fatigue or a student doing something wrong and making sure all the data from the different programs is matching before we adjust their tutoring. Um, we also, this year we did something different with my master schedule. We added a 45 minute period dedicated to small group pullouts. Uh, the teachers are working with between four and six kids. And this is related to House Bill 4545. They are pulling out of our electives and they're doing extremely focused tutoring with the teacher on teaks the kids are not getting right. And each group is, um, they're, all, they're all kids that are they're from different classrooms in each group and they're all working on the same teaks together. And once they master those teaks and we figure that out either through testing or their classwork, we will move them out of that group and pull somebody in that still needs some help. Um, and then we're also using our EE2L coaching a lot. This year, uh, the teachers are working very closely with our coaches. And when they're meeting with the teachers, they're discussing specific uh, curriculum related problems with our, what our kiddos are not understanding and they're offering us different ways to teach it. Uh, a lot of creative ideas that our teachers are incorporating in the classroom. You can go to math data. Okay. Again, here's pre-K and kinder. Uh, you can see in pre-K on the percentage growth, uh, we went from 73% to 79% passing. So that's a 6% growth. And uh, kindergartners, 39 to 46% with 7% growth. And when you look at the data, one thing to point out is you'll always see pre-K is a lot higher. Pre-K and kinder do a different testing system. Theirs is one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. We bring substitutes into the school to help with the classroom, and our teachers pull the kids out and teach them one-on-one, -on -one, um, work with them one-on-one. -on -one. The first and second grader are in a computer lab. They're using a computer program. And again, that special ed, that was one student. and went from 25% to 0%. That was one student that didn't pass. You go to the next one, please. Okay, our first grade. Our uh, growth again, 27% to 33%, so we had 6% growth. Our SPED uh, lost 15%. I think I had seven kids in SPED, and one of those seven did not pass it. That passed it last time. Um, and our EL again shows a lot of growth, 23% with our English language students. Any questions on this? I know I'm going pretty quick. Well, I, it's I a lot of numbers. 
the Waterford, you know, could you explain what that is? I mean, I, I, I'm kind of unfamiliar with that term. I don't know what that Waterford. is. Waterford.org is a company that, uh, that we utilize their curriculum. It's part of our blended learning grant, and their whole focus is on early literacy. And so they have, com they have a computer program the kids do in small groups on their laptops or on their tablets, and they can read a story. The little ones might listen to a story, and then they're asked some comprehension questions. Uh, the program reads the student, though. So say they have the starter story with a first grader, and he takes, does two of them and doesn't get anything right, well, they're going to lower the, uh, the, the uh, to make the story a little easier for the, for the kids to read, and then they'll test them again on it. And if a kid blows it away with 100 the first time, it'll give them a harder story, and we can, we can view all that data. But it's basically an online program when the teacher's doing small groups. You'll see the teacher with one group in the back of the room. One group might be doing a hands-on activity here. One group's at a table here with laptops around a table. That's the Waterford group. And then they'll rotate, and they'll do their 15 minutes, and then they'll go to the teacher. The group doing the small group projects moves to the Waterford, and that's how we're rotating through our classroom. So the testing is done through STAR 360 and CLI, which is just a testing platform. The Waterford is the online program we use as part of our curriculum in our school. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, second grade, please. Okay, uh, second grade, uh, this is where we were worried because we're on math now, and when we saw this data, we immediately uh, made adjustments. If you look, we only had 2% growth in our uh, math scores, and I had some red there with our uh, white students, our special ed students, and our eco-disadvantaged students. Again, special ed was one or two students, <clears throat> but still that grabbed all of our attention, and we were totally focusing on reading. We had some very, very low readers. Uh, I don't want to get into all the letter grades and all that, but we basically had first and second graders at pre-primer and beginning kinder level reading. And so I told my tutors, get those kids reading because the math is word problems. And if they can't read, they can't even do the math. And so uh, the first half of the year, we spent really doing intensive reading tutoring. And it actually shows in the math score. So we have, we have changed all that. My teachers have been through uh, Zern math training. Uh, my tutors, which is a math program the state's providing for us. And we're starting to incorporate that now to get the math scores up. Any questions on that? Okay, Blaze, last one. Okay, we're doing a lot of the same with our math. The big difference is we started adding a lot more tutoring with math, but we do meet every week with our PLCs and look at scores. Um, all of our lessons are changing. It's like a, it's fluid. We change constantly as the kids are progressing and as they're getting better. Uh, a lot of small group work in the classroom. Again, the E2L coaches are helping us with math also. Um, we're doing a lot of small groups with our power professionals with the math. I have uh, three paras that rotate through the school, and they are work. They're doing small group pullouts with the kids. They each have their own room. They pull them out to, and they're working with them on math. Uh, again, we're using our data from Star 360. Waterford does have a math uh, part of it also, so we are using our. We're comparing our 360 data and our Waterford data to make sure that the kids are matching up. We had some kids at the beginning of the year basically that guessed through the test, and then we were spending time tutoring them, and they were getting hundreds on everything we were tutoring them. So now we've evolve to adjust that if they just guess through the test and their water forward and their grade level and classwork is showing that they're higher than the one test showed we are not having to pull them into those really intense groups and uh any questions for me i think i went a little quick sorry i have a couple questions okay Go ahead. Um, just to have a better understanding and thank you for taking mm -hmm. us through grade by grade where we see the district target goals mm -hmm. Is that collectively for the campus in that for math? So it's kinder through second? The district target goals you're looking at. The top here in this math section? Yeah, that is per grade here. level. That's broken down per grade level. So when you look below, I have my growth. Uh, when you look, and then my top is going to be my, my uh, goals, my target goals for each year. Okay, so where it says, um, for instance, pre K math. 2022 beginning of year okay 73 percent that's the goal that's the district's goal I want to make sure I'm oh I wasn't let me make sure I'm getting to the right one pre-k there we go uh you were looking at the 70 which one 73 percent that's what the score was that's how many of our kids passed that's our meets so then if you look up, you'll see the district target goal. So we're in a 21-22. Our target goal is 85%. Okay. But that 85% is for, it says 
it doesn't identify which grade that 85% is for 2022. That's why I'm asking, is it collectively for? No, because I did the. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the, where, where you're with the, the, it's collectively for pre-K and kinder. Okay. On an average. And then the next one is collectively for first and. Just first. Just first and, then and then the third one is just oh, okay. second grade. There we go. Okay. Yes. That's why they're going. For kinder and pre -K. Okay. That's why they change and they're different. The tests are different. So when we do the pre K test, we always see 70 to 90% scores. When we do our STAR 360, we're always seeing 20 to 40, and then we bring it up throughout the school year. Okay. It's a different test. And then another question Are there um, resources available? Like I know you talked about Waterford, but is there something else that we can um, that help identify? If there's anything that we're missing, something that we can help those in the special populations, like economically disadvantaged, for example, well, we, we're facing other challenges than maybe some of the other populated populations. Um, I'm not clear on that one. Other challenges, just like oh, like if they're dyslexic or something like that. You know, what are the barriers to learning for that they're facing? That they're facing. We would be looking at what they're under the teaks that they're getting and not getting is all that data will show us. Okay, so yes, it's uh, teaks driven. Teaks driven, yes, ma'am. And our, our teachers are mainly focusing on, they're not looking at sub pops or white or race or any of that. They're saying, he doesn't get it. I'm going to work with him in a small group, and that's that. Yeah, they're looking at what they understand, and they're using this data that I'm presenting, the STAR 360 and the Waterford, but then they also are with them in class all day. So they're using their every day of the week, those kids are rotating with that teacher for 10 to 15 minutes at their desk, sitting with them one-on-one, -on -one, and that's where they're identifying a ton of things, just sitting with them in small groups of four and five kids. Any other questions? Any other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, only because this is about data, and I know that that has encumbered everyone in education mm -hmm. since the start of COVID, and it's quite the monster from a from a tech sp perspective. Mm -hmm. So, um, with Waterford, Star Three Hundred and Sixty, um, and CLI. CLI, is that encompassing the data enough for you to? easily do your job without it taking away lots of man hours yes okay <laughs> star 360 is a quick report um <laughs> one of the benefits of waterford is there's a live person at the end of the phone i call kathy when i need help and kathy <laughs> prints up the report and emails it to me in about two minutes that's perfect and so it's not like we're getting lost in customer service or hey fill out this form and wait a day for them to get back They're, they get to us immediately all the companies we're using cli and uh CLI Engage is very, very user friendly also. We can go right in there and pull data. And then of course the teachers all, they know who they're really watching. Mm -hmm. And so they're maintaining tons of data on those kids. We also have a Google Drive uh, that I'm not showing you here, but I maintain one for my campus that the teachers consistently update with grades and test scores and three weeks test and six weeks test. And so basically helps us if I see a low 360 score and a kid bombed a test, I can go look at the other data chart and wait, he's been straight A's in class and he gets 100 and he's reading at a end of second grade level. Why did he bomb that test? It could have been there was a mom and dad had a fight the night before and he didn't sleep. I mean, and then we can figure those kind of things out. That's good to know because um, I know that's just the conversation, you know, nationally of mm -hmm. just we're trying to do our jobs, but we're also trying to learn to process all of data. this data. Yeah. And so I, that, that I just wanted to make sure that the programs that are readily available to you guys are are actually making your lives easier. <laughs> I think uh, Shelly chose some good programs a long time ago, and we've been using <laughs> them for years now. So when COVID hit, we already had them down. That's, that's wonderful. So.
<laughs> so well, not switching we, stuff every year or two is really helping. Hopefully we're seeing those end results when they get up to, to Mr. Sager's classroom at Charlie Marshall. So that's where they start taking the state mandated mm -hmm. tests and then that's where the ones that uh, we're rated on and th those ones, that, that this is kind of good information to see if they're getting ready, but the, the, the bottom line is, is what happened Mr. Sager's campus. So we hope we get those kids prepared better down there so his grades are higher when you get to him because he didn't have to work as hard to get him up to where he should be at. So, so good job. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Next is the uh, construction report, Mr. Bennett. Okay. I believe we have in your packet you have the uh, punch list. It's, it's pretty much the same one as last time except it's updated. I got Vince at uh, 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 Weaver Jacobs went through and added where you're you seeing green is where he made the adjustments. Uh, like the baseball uh, netting, it was going to be end of February, March, but then they decided, you know, it could possibly be a disruption, so they're going to wait till the end of the year. And that is also the time they'll make the foul pole move that we know is coming to uh, get the field adjusted correctly. Um, They'll still come out and check on the any trim. I think they're kind of waiting to make sure uh, that they, when they come out, they do it once, not to keep coming out. So on that, then you see a couple of things completed. Uh, chain link fence been completed, corner trim on that building. Um, the welding on the, girl, the girls' uh, dugout at the softball field, what happened there is those fences were supposed to be eight foot and they, they were six foot posts put in and they're already in the cement so they couldn't go in and pull them out so they added the additional two foot but when uh coach taylor and i when coach taylor brought to my attention without looked and we weren't very happy with the way those look so they're going to come back and redo that after the season and, and put that adjustment down at the bottom of the <laughs> pipe they're going to make it eight foot uh there'll be a coupling down there and they'll hide it where it won't look it, you, you won't be able to see it but uh that's what that was um the rest of these things that are on there are completed, like I said. Um, and that's that's pretty much the big part of uh, Weaver Jacobs. Uh, we're still in contact. If, if something comes up, we call Vince or Todd, and they come and check on it. So they're still working uh, uh, for, with any little things that come up. But for the most part, besides the uh, netting backstop of the baseball field and the uh, welding, the dugout post, they're pretty much done. Then uh, we had a few things with Multichem, which they're the ones that did the actual field. Uh, and most of theirs has been completed at this time. Uh, they just did the bullpen work today on number four there. You see it was scheduled where they came today and they got that. They, they, they had installed them a little close, we felt. So we had them widen them out a little bit and make it a little safer. And uh, the top dressing will come at the end of the season because they don't want to get, they can't get out there and uh, that's a, a uh, a layer of sand basically over the grass to fill in any little, you won't be able to see the uh, 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 ridges between the grass where they laid the sod. So that's coming at the end of the season. Um, what else? The hydro seeding was done, the irrigation's there. Um, the seed is, it's, it's there, it should start, uh, should start seeing some growth. It could take anywhere from through, you can see a little now, but it could be up to eight weeks before you really, really see it. And, and uh, when the weather uh, is, is warm during the day and night, like it's getting to be now, that's when it'll really start growing. Um, we do we, have we, the. We got irrigation that kind of waters oh those yeah, areas. Oh, so yeah. He, I, think, okay. I think Arnold is watering it three times a day at least. Well, so we had, it's not part of the irrigation. He has manually water, or is he irrigation oh, no, working? That was the irrigation okay. we had put in all those areas. Um, we do have the logos that go on the end of the batting cages already in. Uh, Mr. Ocho was going to try to get to those today to actually go ahead and put them up, but it looked like it'll be tomorrow maybe, but we do have them in. They'll go on one end, and then we have the letters ordered to go on the other end, and that'll just be we're at the mercy of shipping and all that on that, but it, they'll be coming, and, and, and they'll be installed. Is there any questions on any of that? So on the facial there on the on the batting cages we they did do where uh, we got the people that did the uh, emblems on the other end they're all also going to do the lettering on the other side. 
Uh, no, sir. We we got the uh, signs made. It's around. We are AP sign. We're going one end, and then we're ordering the letters from uh, Corpus Christi Metal Works, I think, or something like that. They, they do the letters, same type letters that are on the uh, where you walk in the arch. Mm -hmm. There'll be individual letters, and they'll they'll install those. That's on the bedding cage, right? No. Oh, you had your mm -hmm. oh, so those, those are still we're still waiting on those to happen, right? So they are ordered. It just when they tell what it takes them to come in, we get them put up. Yeah, I know you're on the mercy of the shipment, so yeah. just like everybody else in the world, right? <laughs> so <laughs> anybody else got any questions? So after this, it'll just be the final walkthrough, and then it's done. Pretty well, much, we we've we've already done a walk through a couple mm -hmm. of times actually and these are just some final we all know where we are on these uh, uh once they're done uh th we'll make sure these are done correctly but the things up to this point we've already done walk through and, and some of those even though they, they may do a, a final final walk through we know that they're not going to be able to come again complete uh, after the season's over in the mm -hmm. summertime frame so they may be nothing happening for two months before they come back so you know uh, they may be complete with everything for a while, but they have to come back and correct a couple of things and they're aware of what they need to correct and we got it in writing. So we're all in agreement about what we need to do and what they still need to do. So yeah. any other questions? The uh, next item on the agenda is enrollment attendance COVID-19 reports. Mr. Bennett. Okay. Uh, you have the fourth six weeks uh, enrollment and uh, Attendance data there, the district totals during four, six weeks were at 1666. Attendance, uh, 86.56, and of course we're looking for 95 or better, but though the four, six weeks was right after uh, Christmas break, you know, into February, and our numbers were still, we were still had some COVID numbers. Uh, so that's, that's what affected the attendance all the way, all the way through, and you see it each, each campus was under 90% on that. But when you go to the uh, next page with the uh, attendance after that, you can start you start seeing the attendance rates going up and it, and it pretty much correlates with, with our COVID numbers dropping dramatically to our attendance rate coming up to, you know, they're, they're pushing the 90% uh, if not 91, 92 percent, a lot of times, uh, and, and it is uh, we haven't, you know, we don't knock on wood, we don't say it too much, but we we haven't had a, a, a lot of COVID cases. We had a couple last week, and those were the first two in about three weeks, I believe. So it, it's 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 a pretty much a correlation between the attendance and, and how the COVID's gone, and it looks like now uh, we're, we're we've hit a stretch where our attendance is starting to come up a little bit. And do we have any idea, you know, how that's going to affect our funding, Cheryl? Do we know, we have got anything from them yet that they're, they're looking at giving us a waiver again like they did before for attendance? Or? Yeah, there's nothing about a waiver. Yeah. I don't think Ms. Cook's looking, thinking, and from what she's heard, like like anything's coming, any help that way. But I, nothing for sure yet. But So our money may be less next year because of our attendance down below. If it's like, you know, we're, we're shooting for 95% and we're coming up with 92% <laughs> overall, we... Maybe hurting for money a little bit more next year. So, got, got to tighten the belts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody else got any questions on that? Next item is the first reading of a district initiated policy change DEC local uh, compensation and benefits and leaves and absences and FMC local student activities. <coughs> Mr. Bennett? Yes, sir. On a uh, on DEC local on page three of six, what uh, what we're looking at there is striking the discretionary use of leave shall not be permitted on the day before a school holiday, the day after a school holiday, day scheduled for end of semester or end of year exams, day scheduled for state assessments or professional or staff development days. Pretty much striking that because in the uh, introductory paragraph, it explains how that would be governed. Uh, you know, it, it, 
in the first paragraph says, in deciding whether to approve or deny a request for discretionary use of state personal leave, the supervisor shall not seek or consider the reasons for which an employee requests. It's their leave, they're asking for it. What they do consider is how the, uh, the duration of the requested absent in conjunction with the effect of the employee's absences on the educational program and district operations as well as the availability of substitutes. So the, the principals take all that consideration for they uh, approve or disapprove regardless of the reason for, uh, for the absence. You know, we, we've had through the years, you'll have uh, weddings, you'll have uh, possible funerals, you'll, you'll have, you'll have um, college visits, who knows, that the, the parents just can't work around and the students or, 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 the, or the teachers or parents, you know, the teachers have to miss and if they miss the way this is written, written now, uh, they basically get docked for missing the day before or after or any of these other days that are listed. So in the first reading, that's what's to be considered, uh, whether to strike that part or not. Yeah, what it does basically allow employees a little bit more uh, flexibility in when, they're, when, they're, when they can take their, their, their discretionary leave. And, and so if there's some emergency right now, the way it sits, if, it, you, know, if you have a death in the family doing tax testing, too bad. You know, you can't leave, or, or your son's getting married, or something like that. Well, you can't, you know, you just, you know, just, or you have a wedding in the family that you would like to attend, and those type of things, because we, you know, it prevents the, our staff from being able to attend those things. So, uh, and again, leaving it up to discretion of administrators, if they can make it happen, they make it happen. If they don't, they say, well, we can't, you know, we can't, and that's going to be their decision, so. Yeah, and I think that's the way the kind of policy is changing too. And that's what we're kind of working towards on that change. Right. Anybody got any questions on that? Any comments? Okay. Another section. I was just um, the definition on page one of one towards the top. It says on the definition of family member. I mean, excuse me, of immediate family. Um, that's broader than on page two of six when we talk about the medical certification that's required for FEMLA under item three. The employee requests FEMLA leave for the employee's serious health condition, a serious health condition of the employees, and we limit it to spouse, parent, or child. Well, FMLA is probably governed by. That we wouldn't allow. Yeah, the, the, yeah there's the other family members. I just want to make sure that it's, that's driven still by. The statute. Well, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. That we, we, yeah, we can, we can change our policy, but we can't change theirs. They, they have their own definitions of what, what, what falls under their guidance. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, that's Next on the agenda is calendar of upcoming events. Excuse me, we, s we still have F oh. uh, FM. FM well, local, we had two, I'm sorry. two policies to consider. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and Thank you. And, and on this one, uh, this is FM uh, local again. Uh, district shall make no distinction between absences for UIL activities, absences for other extracurricular activities approved by the board. Uh, what we're uh, looking at there is, uh, and Ms. Hale could speak if you have a specific question is we have students that are involved and in, when they're involved in everything, it, these they still catch them. And you may have a kid that, that uh, has to miss a track meet, a tennis meet, a golf meet, or a baseball game, or whatever, because they played football or volleyball and a, a cheerleading or whatever in the fall, then those numbers start catching up with them. Doesn't happen just every day, but it does happen to some and the ones it's going to happen to are the kids that are eligible all the time and participate all the time so uh in this one uh with with we we emailed talked to tasby a couple times about it and uh the recommendation or what we're looking at is to strike the part with the numbers because the first sentence kind of covers everything these are the reasons it would be you know excuse it's an extracurricular uh activity Approved, already approved by the board. They're, they're, work, they're, they're, they're participating in activities that the board's already approved. Um, and I think we've had a couple this came real close, Ms. Hale. Yeah, we had, and that's with 15 days and we still had some get close. Uh, 
Well, I, I know in the in the past we've we've had a couple of kids that couldn't, you know, especially towards the end of the year when it starts really mounting up, and, and there's something going on for like tennis or track, and uh, and, and a kid can't go participate in the event because he's run out of days, and we just can't, you know. And so this this doing away with this restriction will allow them the luxury to be able to compete in all those different things they qualify for. So right. without penalty. Without right. penalty. And yes. it's not a UIL uh, no. ruling. It's a it's a board. It's our policy. So those are the two. Anybody got any questions or comments on that? Okay. Next now then is calendar of upcoming events. Okay, I think you have your list there. <laughs> um, April gives you a little, you have a couple, a day in March, which we have this, and then there's a few things in April, but when it gets to May, you, know, you got to have gas in your tank because there's a lot going on. So, uh, and I think, I think the principals, if they really have something, don't, don't mind maybe sending out an email if they, if they have a chance to, as a reminder, uh, but a lot going on you, you we, we have this every year you know this time of year is just a lot of things going on and, and of course our, every campus appreciates any time that any any board can can be there uh, it, it, it means a lot to them and uh, so just any of them that you're able to make is, is, is why you have this list and, and I'd ask administrators my, me personally I, I like to try to attend as much as, as stuff as I can get to that I'm available for uh, so again, if something comes up on it that's not on this list, if you could email it uh, to Miss Cook or whatever else, and they can afford it to the school board, uh, because I, I'm sure a lot of people on the school board would like to attend to some of those events, and it gives them an opportunity to do that. If, if we know about it, we can get there. If we don't know about it, we know, you know, then we're, we're it's, uh, so again, uh, we'd like to get out there and you know, you know, tell the kids how proud we are, I and mean, the teachers and the staff for the jobs they're doing and stuff. So any type of any type of event celebration you got. Uh, you know, like if you have a, a, a deal for celebration with teachers, like uh, the end of school, you know, let us know. We'll show up and, you know, shake their hands and thank them for being here. So just let us know. And uh, if we're available, we'll try to show up and help you out and tell them how much we appreciate the work you're doing for us. So. Uh, anybody got any questions on the upcoming events, comments? Next is financial report, Ms. Stansbury. Accounts payable, budgets, tax, bond, and FEMA. You want to cut accounts payable first? Has everybody had a chance to review those, look at them, have any questions on the, the, uh, the accounts payable, the budget status investments, the tax collection, the bond finance, and the FEMA projects? And again, I don't think there's any surprises there that, you know, we're kind of aware where, where we're going and how, you know, where our monies are going and, and that. So, you know, I don't think there's any, any big surprises there as far as I, I saw when I looked at them. Does anybody have any comments or questions on them? Just a question in general. Anything, uh, have we heard anything from FEMA? Or any indication of impossible <laughs> receiving the reimbursements? <laughs> Yeah, and I've heard rumors that, you know, which is, you know, there's there's not like an infinite amount of money out there for the government to use. So, uh, and, and all the things that uh, FEMA's been putting up with is money lately that they're kind of having a hard time to find money, even though they, they may want to approve it, there may not be money in their budget to give it to you. So, 
that could be a hold up as well, you know, that there's just not money available there to get that right now. So it's my understanding that when FEMA obligated all of our objects, they sent the money to the state of Texas. Oh, they already got it. So it takes it's holding FEMA. Oh, okay. So so money's there and the state's just kinda of holding it up. So the state's using our money and not giving us interest on it, so <laughs> Another, another story, right? <laughs> so it's earmarked for us under a process that they haven't really told us when or how much longer it's going to be. That's the thing. So I appreciate the updates of, of what you have, but I just was curious if. <laughs> well, I, and just for information wise, there's, there's, I know that as far as team wise, there's a lot of organizations and churches in the area that are still waiting for money from FEMA that's out there that they just haven't got yet so and that's been like four years ago so you know th those things are you know it's a slow process so you, you can't you know you, you can't depend upon those showing up real fast you know you got to make sure that you you're gonna have to wait it out for four or five years before you actually see the money so yeah you know the question comments Next on the agenda is cons uh, item number six, the consent agenda, considering the approved minutes of the February 14th regular board meeting and the February 28th special board meeting, special meeting and workshop, I'm sorry. Do, uh, has anybody had a chance to look at the February 14th and the 28th uh, meeting and workshop? Any questions, comments, corrections on those that you saw? Okay, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items? I make a motion. Mr. Delfino, uh, Mr. Flores made a motion. Mr. Rector, second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, motion carries. Next is our action agenda. Consider and approve the uh, TASB Risk Management Fund Interlocal Participation Agreement, Ms. Stansberry. So, so again, can you say what what we get, what we use this for? You, you mentioned there for something for. Has we provide this with our unemployment insurance? Okay. Yeah, that's the only question I had was what what is what is the the management uh, funding the local? I mean, what is the risk management fund? I, I didn't have any I didn't have any idea what that was, but uh, that's what we use it for then. So, thank you. Anybody got any questions on that? Comments? Okay, do I have do I have a motion to approve the amended interlocal participation agreement between TASB Risk Management Fund and Rents Pest ID? So moved. Motion been made by Ms. Butler. Is there a second? Second, second by Ms. Hill. All in favor say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Aye's got it. Next is considered approved the budget amendment for donations from Lamar Womack and Associates Architects, Ms. Stansbury. Anybody have any comments, questions on that? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the budget amendment for the donation received from Lamar Womack and Associate Architects? So, so move a um, motion made by Mr. Rector. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Flores. All in favor say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Thank you. Next is considered approved budget amendment for the Women in Industry Conference donation. Ms. Stansberry again. Any questions on that? Comments? 
And do I have a motion to approve the budget amendment for donation received by APHS students to attend the Women in Conf Industry Conference? So moved. Ms. A motion by made by Ms. Butler. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Hill. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Aye. Right, got it. Next is item eight on the agenda discussion. Any topics for future meetings? Does any board member have any topics that we'd like to, to put on the agenda for next time? Anything that you know that you like the administration to work on and whatever else? So I, I know we we uh, need to start looking at uh, sometime during the summertime frame, which is only like two months away. You know, it's, it's kind of blowing by fast, but you know, April's coming up. Uh, so, you know, sometime in June or something like that, or July, we need to get together as a group for a team of eight training, plus also we got to work on our board, guard, uh, our board goals. Uh, and we also have to work on our five-year facility plan as part of those goals. So uh, we need to have a workshop set up sometime during the summer time frame. So I'll be looking at your schedules and seeing what you, you know, when you're going to be available and what would be the best date. So that, uh, because, because again, for the team of eight training, uh, we're, we're going to have to have some type of uh, uh, moderator to do that for us. And that'll take somebody from the Education Service Center. And we have to have, you know, I'd like to try to give them at least a couple of months notice to, to be able to come. So we can, you know, because again, because of COVID stuff this year, next, next board meeting, we, uh, we have to, show the hours that we've got and wh what courses where we're lacking what we're lacking training in the, the required things the state's put upon the board members so we're going to cover those as part of our next board meeting right blaze so uh that'll be out there but uh we one of those things is is our three hours of of a board of eight training which we just have not been able to do because we just couldn't either get together or have somebody to hear from the education service center with other things going out there with the COVID. so uh, uh, so we're, we're, that's one thing that we're just not going to be able to do, but we probably need to take care of that this summer right off the bat so we don't have to worry about it next year. <laughs> so uh, that, that's some things that, uh, that, that uh, Ms. Cook will probably be working on in the future to try to set something up like that for us. And, yeah. and uh, so, but again, look at your own schedules uh, during, you know, between, you know, uh, sometime in June or July with what you got going and, and vacations or whatever you got going on during that time period and come up with some dates that you'd be available and 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 then maybe you could pass them to Miss Cook now so she can kind of work, start working on that ahead of time so we can kind of get that taken care of this summer. She'd already she'd already kind of brought it up and uh, said that she'd really like you know wants to be let you know what her schedule too because she's got a lot going you know with the, the summer programs and yeah all that going on so yeah. So she, and in fact, you know, what I would like is, is a team of eight team of, instead of you know, a team of seven is a team of eight team of nine. Really, I'd like to include Mr. Bennett into that training because he's in and, and, and really because, you know, he's kind of an integral cog of our team of eight, you know, that uh, he's he's there. And, uh, you know, and it'd be nice to have, you know, I mean, I invite you to kind of join along if you're able to do that. Mm -hmm. That I think that's important to kind of put him because, you know, we're just really we're a team of all of us okay this is not a team of eight okay it's not our seven up here we're team we're a whole team it's, it's administrators the teachers everybody uh the, the maintenance people everybody we're all a team say we're all up for one thing and that's what we you know we, we're working for it is what's best for this district and what's best for our kids so you know so so again uh that's the only thing i can say it's just nothing for topic wise but something we need to start thinking about and for you to start thinking about uh, look at your schedules in June or July and try to get you know pass something to Miss Cook, so she has an idea of what days may be available, so she can start working on that, so we can kind of get it taken care of now, early. One of the suggestions that she had um, with the data workshop to be held in June is to also um, include and go over the academic performance goals that the that the board had previously discussed, or we need to revisit because by then we'll have some more data. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, you're correct, so and that's do yeah. All the goals maybe at that time. Oh, uh, we probably could do both of them because that that's workshop. where we we talked about last time because we weren't able mm -hmm. to meet the the goals that we'd set up last year for COVID and stuff. So we weren't, you know, and, and there's no testing data there available. So we set a goal based upon what we thought the scores were going to be, but there's no scores there to base them on. So 
So we had we just have to move that window down the road, just keep moving it down the road a little bit. And so hopefully uh, the, the, this year we can use it as a baseline and determine where we need to go from there. So we need to, you're, you're right, uh, that'll be a part of our workshop to be doing as well when we're setting up our goals and things so in, in that, so, and identifying that. So, uh, but in June, but again, if you're not, you know, if, if, if a team of eight's not available in June, we may have to do it in July. So, you know, we just have to wait and see, because again, uh, we could always set, I guess we'd always set that up and do it individually, but I'd like to have everybody there. You know, it, you know, I hate making those decisions like that and setting a board goal that that one of our board members is not there to, to voice his opinion on. It's kind of, you know, it, to me that's just, I mean, that's not the way to do business. If, if we're a team of eight, we need to all be there to talk about and set our own, you know, and discuss and put our pros and cons on what we want to do, so. Yeah. So, I but again, one, we just have to work on a date for that, so. I have one request. If we could get um, an update, we've been going to a lot of training and so if we can just make sure, I think there's one more that's available that we can do online now that's been opened up, but if we could um, get updated uh, training rosters, I'm not rosters, uh, training log. Uh, they've been provided to us at the end of fall, and so well, there, several there of us have attended okay. training since then, so I think it, we're pretty close to. Yeah, well, the cybersecurity you can do online. It, I, just, I just completed mine online because you sent out that website, so I got it completed there in that. But there's also, I know there's a summer leadership in, uh, course that's going on this summer that any board member can sign up for and, and go to, but it's like a week course. Is you gotta devote a whole week of your summer off to do that. And that's kind of hard for some people to do if they have jobs and things working. So, but uh, if you go to TASB, there's a bunch of courses that if, if you're on TASB websites and, and go to their websites, there's a bunch of stuff that they put out there that's available for you to, to, to do. Uh, and uh, there are also a lot of courses there that you can take online if you have to complete some of the courses that are required for, for being on the board. Uh, so, uh, you know, take, you know, again, I'd, I'd encourage anybody to take the opportunity between now and April before Ms. Blaze has to put together the reports and, and try to take care of that and make sure that she's aware of it because sometimes it may lag behind a little bit before they put it in there. Okay. So make sure that you, when you get through the UCCG completion and a certificate of completion or something, so make sure she gets a copy of that so she can update her files on it so, uh, so that we're, we show the most updated information in there. So I'm just putting that out to every, all the other board members that, uh, you know, that you know, it may be hard to go in person, but you can always try to get it online if you can, you know, just. Thank you. Appreciate. It. Thank April you. April is just around the corner. <laughs> 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 we gotta update it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next item on the agenda is convening an executive session as authorized, authorized by the Texas Open Meeting Act, Texas Government Code 551.001, concerning any and all uh, any and all purposes permitted by the Act, Section 551.074, personnel, new hire, local certification, and resignations, and the time is now. Uh, I've got 8.13, we're uh, going to adjourn here and go to executive session. And there we go. Okay, the time is now 8.33 and we're back from a closed session and reconvening an open session. And at this time, I uh, would uh, like to hear, do I have a motion to approve the local Teaching certificate utilizing the District of Innovation option for Dr. Elizabeth Worley to serve as CTE and yearbook teacher at Rents Pass High School. So moved. Motion made by Ms. Hill. Do I have a second? Second. Second, second by Ms. Butler. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Next, do I, uh, do I hear a motion to approve the resignations as recommended by administration? Make so a motion. Moved. <laughs> Mr. Flores made a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Hill. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? I just got it. The time is now 8.35, and uh, with no other business before the meeting, I declare this meeting closed. Look at that.